Okay, and then we move on to the last part of today's lectures, and that's going to be the theory of the firm, or what is also called producer theory. Now, producer theory asks questions like, how much does a firm choose to produce, given the prices it sees in the market? Or how much labor does it choose to hire? Or what wages does it choose to pay? And to answer these questions, the marginalist and the marginalist theory that again we're going to look at, again formulates the solution in terms of costs and benefits on the margin. So they look at things like marginal cost, marginal profit, marginal revenue. These are the kinds of tools that they use in their theory. And in fact, producer theory was formulated after consumer theory and what these marginalists did is they often just took the same kind of tools and concepts from the theory of the consumer and applied them to the theory of the firm. And so you'll notice a lot of similarities. And so one obvious one here is that as the consumer maximizes utility in a constrained environment, so too does the firm maximize profits in a constrained environment. And so we'll see that kind of more in detail in a second. So let's start with our kind of equivalent of the utility function for the firm, which is going to be the production function. So the production function takes inputs, capital and labor in our case, and tells us how much output we get for those given inputs. So here we have three terms of interest. So we have labor, sorry, labor, capital, and then Z, which is a technology parameter. Z just, when Z is higher, I'll get more output for any given combination of inputs. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that I noted at the beginning of these lectures is that this is going to be a static model, or what's referred to as short-run production. So we assume that in the short run, capital is fixed. We can't change, the firm can't change capital in the short run. However, the firm can change how much labor is being employed. And so that's going to be kind of what defines this static model for the firm. We're also going to impose further assumptions on the production function, much as we did to the utility function, and that'll be what we do next. And finally, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to kind of try to be critical about some of these assumptions, much as we were for consumer theory. So let's start with our assumptions. The first one is constant returns to scale, which says that if I multiply all of my inputs by some factor, then my output increases by the same factor. Or put kind of more intuitively, if I double my inputs, then my output also doubles. Okay, so what does that look like mathematically? So here's my production function once more. Now, <clears throat> if I increase all of my inputs by some factor, so imagine I multiply both of my inputs by factor lambda. Okay, so if lambda was two, that would mean I'm doubling my inputs. Well, the result is that I double or I increase my output by the same factor, lambda. Okay, so I'll write it in the intuitive way here. Doubling all inputs, sorry, doubling all inputs leads me to double my output. Okay, next, output increases when either input increases. So in other words, when I increase capital, that leads to more output. And likewise, when I increase labor, that leads to more output. Now, of course, this is pretty intuitive. I don't think I need to say much more, but just for completeness here, let's define some terms. So let's define MPN, that's the marginal product of labor. And that's just the derivative of output with respect to labor. Okay, so that's marginal product of labor. And you'll notice that these are kind of 
the equivalence of marginal utility, right? So the other one is the marginal product of capital. And again, that's just the derivative of the production function with respect to capital. Okay, and this second assumption really just says that MPN and MPK are greater than zero. So whenever I increase capital or I increase labor, output increases as well. Next, the marginal product of labor is decreasing in labor. So in other words, as I increase the amount of labor employed, that decreases the marginal product of capital. And again, this is kind of the equivalent of this decreasing marginal utility, right? Now I have decreasing marginal product of labor. And to put this mathematically, it would just be that the derivative of the marginal product of labor is less than zero. And then we have the equivalent for capital. That's assumption four, is simply that the marginal product of capital is decreasing as we increase capital. And so the same thing holds. The derivative of marginal product of capital with respect to capital is less than zero. Now, why is this? Because it's not necessarily obvious that this should be the case. And the argument that's made and we'll come back to this later, but the argument that's made is that there's some kind of congestion going on. So the story that was told to me when I learned this, and I think is a good illustration of this point, is imagine a Subway restaurant, you know, where they make Subway sandwiches. The capital in this case is just the counter, you know, where they make the sandwiches, the oven where they bake the bread and so on. This is the capital. Now imagine for some fixed amount of capital, I increase the number of workers I have making sandwiches. As I increase them, there's gonna be kind of this congestion. There will be more workers trying to work with a set amount of capital, with a set space in the subway restaurant. So with set counter space, with a set, you know, one oven or whatever is used in, in a subway restaurant. And so as I add more workers, each additional one becomes less productive because of this congestion. The total sort of productivity of the workers is declining. And so that's why both of these are defined for a fixed amount of the other factor. So this story I was telling was about the decreasing marginal product of labor. Um, there we go. It was this story here. It's that for some fixed amount of capital, as I increase labor n, my workers become less and less productive because of this sort of congestion within of use of the capital. And you could tell the same sort of story with uh, the capital stock. For some fixed number of workers, say they're, I don't know, IT people, as I increase computers that my IT people are working with, each additional computer might yield me sort of less productivity. And the reason is just because I only have so many workers to work on those computers. And so as I increase the number of computers, each additional one is less productive. And so I have this decreasing marginal product of capital. So that's assumptions three and four. Our final one, assumption five, is the marginal product of labor increases when capital increases. And this is kind of the flip side of what we were just talking about, right? So in my Subway restaurant example, there's this congestion as I increase the number of workers, but this congestion is alleviated if I increase the amount of capital. So if I increase the amount of counter space in the restaurant or the number of ovens or whatever, and so to put this mathematically, it would be that the derivative of the marginal product of labor with respect to capital is greater than zero. Or thinking about it graphically, so here we have our decreasing marginal product of labor curve. And this says that, we'll say this is for capital one. As capital increases to capital two, 
that pushes up the marginal product of labor curve. And so again, the argument here is that increasing the amount of capital relieves this congestion. And it means that additional workers are now more productive. Okay, so with these assumptions in hand, let's graph the production function. What would it look like? So remember the production function is one that takes our inputs as given, I'll make this slightly smaller, takes our inputs, sorry, and gives us outputs. And in particular, the input that we're varying is labor, or ND, labor demand. And our output is capital. Remember, or sorry, not capital, is Y, output. And capital is fixed, recall. So this says, as we increase labor, it should increase output, Y. <clears throat> and notice that the slope of this is just the marginal product of labor, right? That says how much output do we get when I increase labor by one more unit? And that's just the definition of the marginal product of labor. So we get two features of this given by our assumptions. So one is that it's increasing the line is increasing, and this comes from two, which is, I'll go back here really quickly, that's increasing from two, which is that output increases when either input increases. So that's simply that the marginal product of labor is positive, and the slope is decreasing because of three. And three, was the assumption that we have this decreasing marginal product of labor. So as labor increases, the slope becomes flatter because marginal product of labor is falling. We could also think about um, our assumption five. <clears throat> and that would, so remember assumption five was what happens to the marginal product of labor when capital increases. And also, well, let me draw it here. So what I'm saying now is we could look at what happens to our production function if we increase capital. So this is ZF K1 and D. And then if we increase capital, I'll draw it in red here, it shifts up the production function as so. Okay, so that's K2, where K2 is higher. And so it shifts up because of two, right? Where assumption two was that uh, output increases in both. So you'll notice here now for any, n, for any n labor, we now have a higher output and that's because output is increasing in our higher amount of capital. Whoops, sorry about that. Okay. And then you'll also notice that the uh, slope of the line is becoming steeper now. So this slope here is steeper than the slope here. And the reason for that is because of five. So slope for any n increases because of five where five was that marginal product of labor is increasing in capital. Okay, now let's think about this analytically here. So we have the production function. What does the firm wanna do? Well, it wants to maximize its profits. Okay, so writing this mathematically, that means the firm wants to maximize profits and remember it can only choose labor, ND, labor demand. So profits are how much it produces. Okay, so that's just the production function minus how much it has to pay its workers. Now, notice that we're not accounting for any payments to capital. Okay, and I'll put this in red here. And that's that, remember, so recall, capital is fixed. So it's already purchased. So 
So that's why that doesn't appear in our profit maximization problem. <clears throat> okay, so great. That's our profit maximization problem. How do we solve it? Well, it's just calculus at this point, right? So to solve any maximization, all we do is we take the derivative with respect to our variable of interest, so that's nd, and we set it equal to zero. And the point at which that derivative is equal to zero is the point of maximization. And so that's the point at which profits will be maximized. So if we take that derivative, all it gives us is, so the derivative of this first part is just the marginal product of labor by definition. And the derivative of the second part is just W. And so rearranging, that just tells us that the firm will be maximizing its profits when the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. Okay, so put another way, it's going to increase its labor until the marginal product of that labor is equal to the wage. So let's see that graphically in two ways, I believe. Yes, I'll show you that graphically in two ways. So first is by looking at the production function. So let's graph that quickly here. So here's our production function. So here's nd and then y. And our production function we saw looks something like this. Okay. And then let's put one other thing on this graph. And that's going to be a line. There we go which is W times ND. So that's how much I have to pay my workers at any amount of labor employed. Now, remember that profits are this top line, the production function, minus this bottom line, which is how much I have to pay my workers. So put another way, profits are the vertical distance between those two lines. So this would be, for example, I'll call this ND1. This would be the profits if I employed ND1. Now you can see that this is increasing, these profits are increasing up until the point where the slope of the production function is equal to the wage. Up until that point, the production function is increasing faster than the wage line, and so therefore the vertical distance between them is increasing. After that point, the slope is f of the production function is smaller than the wage line, and therefore the vertical distance between them is falling. And so therefore our profits are maximized at this point, I'll call it nd star, and that will have the highest profit given our production function. And so, again, this just gives us the same solution we had before, right? It says that profits are maximized when the slope of the production function, which we saw was just the marginal product of labor, is equal to the wage. So that's the exact same solution we saw before. I've just shown it to you graphically. Now the final way to see this is to think about the labor demand curve. So notice that this relationship, that the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage, gives us a demand curve for labor. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, a demand curve says, given the price of something, so in this case the price of labor is the wage, how much of it do I demand? And so that would be, a curve that has labor demand on one axis and the wage on the other and relates the two. And that's really what we have here. This is the marginal product of labor curve, which is giving us this labor demand relationship. And now let's just use it quickly to understand really what this labor demand curve or what this, why the firm is choosing to employ labor up into the point where the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. Well, imagine the following. Imagine that the wage is this. 
call it W0, okay? <clears throat> Why will I not employ this labor, this amount of labor? I'll call it ND1. Well, the reason is simple. It's think about what this means. This point here is the marginal product of labor. Okay, that's the marginal product of labor evaluated at ND1. So that's how much additional output I can get at this current point, how much additional output I can get by employing one more worker. So that's the benefit of employing one more worker. What's the cost? The cost of employing one more worker is this wage, W0. Notice that the cost of employing that worker is far less than the benefit. And so therefore it makes sense to employ more workers because I'm getting a higher benefit in terms of output than I'm paying out in cost. And so then I'd say, okay, great, employ more workers. So I employ workers up until this point now, ND2. And then I look again. And again, I see that at this point, the marginal product of labor is still higher than the wage. And so that means that employing one more worker will give me more output than I'm paying out in wage. And so again, I increase my output and I keep doing that up until the point where the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. When it's equal to the wage, now I have no more incentive to increase the number of workers I'm hiring. Because at this point, now when I increase the number of workers I hire, that will give me exactly the amount in output as I pay out in the wage. So my profits won't increase at all, right? The amount I'm getting from employing that worker, the marginal product of that worker, is just equal to what I'm paying him or her. And so as a result, I'm not increasing my profits. And so at that point, I no longer have an incentive to employ more workers. And that's why this gives us the amount of workers that the firm wants to employ at any wage. Pick any wage on this curve, you know, say this one. And again, the same logic applies. The firm will keep hiring workers up until the marginal product of labor is equal to the wage. Okay, what about changes in productivity? What do those do? So remember our productivity term is that Z term. Well, first let's look at our production function. I'm gonna do it small. I'm gonna try to do three graphs on this slide here. So here's our production function in terms of ND, there's Y. And remember that that's just equal to Z times this function F of K and ND. What happens if we increase Z? Well, you won't be surprised to see that it just shifts up, right? So this is Z1. If we increase Z, that just means that output is now higher for any labor supplied or labor demanded, sorry. And also for the same reason that we saw when we increased capital, this also increases the slope at any point, okay? I guess you can't see in that drawing, but you can imagine this slope is smaller than this one. And so what does that mean? It means that now the marginal product of labor is higher, let me write that here. So that means that now the marginal product of labor will be higher for any labor demand. This is the marginal product of labor. Sorry, that's the wrong thing. Now the marginal product of labor is higher. So that's marginal product of labor. I'm also confusing my MPN, not MPL, I'm sorry. So that's MPN at set one, and this is MPN at set two. So finally, notice that this also means that labor demand increases, okay? So remember that the labor demand curve is just the marginal product of labor curve. And so this also means that now labor demand has increased and our labor demand curve shifts out. <clears throat> 